From historic Quebec City, the home of the Quebec Winter Carnival, and from the Peps Arena at Laval University, we bring you the 1977 Uniroyal World Junior Curling Championship. and officials from Europe and North America are here as Canada defends the title won at Aviemore, Scotland by Paul Gausel of Calgary. Coley Campbell, the president of the International Curling Federation, and Uniroyal coordinator Bob Sutherland play a part in opening ceremonies. So does Jean-Francois Bertrand for the province of Quebec and Bob Grierson, president of the Royal Caledonian Curling Club. Pierre Greco is the general chairman and Jacques Laforet, MC. Raising the Uniroyal banner now is a traditional start for the competition. It will hang throughout the round robin and the four team playoffs to follow. Monsieur Bertrand has the honor of delivering the first stone. Naturally, it has to wind up in the four foot circle and a fine bit of footwork by Grierson achieves the desired result. In the action that came later, the real story was a classic comeback for Canada. France lost to Switzerland in the final round to create a three-way tie for fourth place. Canada beat France and then had to get by the Swiss. Switzerland had a chance to tie the game on the 10th end, but this final Swiss stone failed to make the house. It gave Canada a 4-2 victory. So Canada has advanced to the semifinals here at the Peps Arena this afternoon with a come from behind victory against Switzerland. They'll be moving into the semifinals in a game against the United States while Norway takes on Sweden. But how did they get there? Well, let's go back this week and trace what happened in the Uniroyal World Junior Curling Championship. Claude Fage of France was one of four skips repeating in the Uniroyal. He was most impressive at Aviemore, and in the early going in Quebec City, Fage was almost a one-man show. This was the kind of shot-making he produced. A perfect freeze in the eighth end of his opening game against the United States. The first game was a major disappointment to the American team. They lost to France 12-8, but Don Barkham Jr. of North Dakota was to go on to prove it was only a temporary setback. With the same team he had in Scotland, Barkham proceeded to win eight in a row. Another team that was back intact was skipped by Shur Lewin of Norway, who had to be one of the favorites in 77. Lewin received fine support all week from his front end of Rohr Risa and Hans Becklund. And Morten Sagode was close to an all-star ranking at third. Sweden had a new skip this time. Anders Gran was promoted from third to succeed junior graduate Jan Olsten. Ron made the Swedes contenders, but he too had misses in crucial situations that proved costly. Canadian hopes to retain the Uniroyal Trophy rested on Bill Jenkins' team from Prince Edward Island. Prospects seemed bright as Jenkins started with wins over Norway and West Germany. Then came France, and the Canadians had to rally from a 5-1 deficit after three ends but Jenkins battled back to lead 6-5 after 7. Then more trouble came on the 8th, as you see Jenkins trying to bury his final stone. He's in for shot, but most of it was showing, and Fage saw the chance to vault back into command in the game. For France and Canada trails 8-6 with just two ends to go. Jenkins could have lost his determination right there. The French youngster had turned the momentum and knew his chances were excellent to grab first place after three rounds. 
Canada scored a single on the ninth to make it 8-7 in France's favor. Jenkins kept plugging away. Here's his last stone on the tenth. Beige had no choice. He had to go for the double takeout. But he kills only the front stone. The game is tied, and they go to an extra end. On the 11th, Canada got the front stones they wanted, and Jenkins played a guard on the potential winner in the four-foot circle. That put it right up to the 18-year-old skip from Mejev, the French curling capital. victory over France. Canada now had three wins, but against Sweden and Italy the next day, nothing went right. Jenkins lost to Sweden, and here against Italy, it's another extra end. Massima Alvera of Cortina was back with a much improved team over 76 at Aviemore. Takeout sets up two Italian counters on the 11th end. And Jenkins needs an eight-foot draw to win it. However, watch this sweeping miscue. Three. Jenkins thinks he's light. Three. Three. has scored a 7-6 upset. The Italians wound up with four wins and five losses. Then came Denmark in the standings with two and seven. Peter Sundberg led the Danish team in its second appearance in the World Junior Championship. They scored a surprising victory over France and added another triumph in this game against West Germany. The German team was simply too young and inexperienced. Pascal Piru and Tommy Mueller Stoy were only 13. Florian Zimmerman was 15. And the skip Ralph Zimmerman barely 18. They lost every game, most by one sided margins. But the Scottish team had potential. Gavin Wiseman really worked up a sweat at third for the Scots. And Archie Craig and Tom McGregor were a capable front end. The skip was Lockhart Steele, and he more than held his own with Canada's Jenkins, who needed a deuce on the 10th end to force an extra end in their game. By now, both teams had to win to have any chance at the playoffs. With his last rock on the 11th, Jenkins came too far, trying to guard a Canadian stone in the four-foot circle. Steele had to try for the double takeout. Canada is still alive with a 7-5 victory. Louis Chasse will tell the Radio Canada Network about that one. When France lost to Switzerland in the final round, Canada joined those countries in a three-way tie for fourth place. The Swiss had beaten both opponents and earned the bye for the tie-breaking games. Canada continued its uphill climb by defeating France 7-3 and moved into this nail-biter with Switzerland. It was a two-all game playing the ninth end, and despite a double takeout by Jurgen Tanner, the Canadians steal a point here and take a 3-2 lead.
Jenkins plays his final stone on the 10th then. Oh! Oh! He's after the only Swiss rock in the house. And Canada still has a counter in the 12-foot circle. Now Tanner has his shot at tying it up again. The intern draw. They stop brushing it. But that's a fatal error. A 4-2 win for Canada. And so, it's on to the semifinals. But first, there's time for a scenic tour of old Quebec. And what other way than by horse and calèche? They had to go everywhere in this thing. Even has air conditioning. That's right. <laughs> it's a cold stream. Good warm heater. <laughs> it's better than your car, huh? Away! <laughs> <laughs> From the famous Chateau Frontenac Hotel, the curlers head out to see the city walls. Quebec is the only walled city north of Mexico in North America. French settlers under Champlain and Frontenac built the old town and the narrow streets and most of the original structures have been preserved. The people of Quebec give you that bonhomme feeling, a warmth that has been called de joie de vie. It's semi-final time at the Peps Arena. The matchups are Scandinavian in one case, Norway versus Sweden, and North American in the other, Canada versus the United States. Sure Lewin of Norway scores one on the first end, and here on the second is an excellent shape. He lies two and tries to plug up the front. Norwegian coach Lars Tvetter likes the situation. Anders Gran of Sweden has to draw through a port with his final stone. But Norway steals two, and the Norwegians have a 3-0 lead after two ends. The United States grabbed two points on the first end against Canada, but on the second end, Don Barkham is in deep trouble with two stones to come. Barkham didn't get the roll that he wanted. This was the key end of the game, as Bill Jenkins pointed out later. Well, the second end, we picked up a, a big four-ender. We missed a couple of shots in the first end and gave them a two, but the boys, they just kept fighting and they missed a few. And it was relatively easy to pick it up as I just did wide open takeouts. So that was really the changing point in the game. And it's four to two Canada after two ends. Back in the other game, Sweden has started a rally. Anders Gran hit the board with a deuce on the third end, and upcoming is another single. Sure Lewin rolls too far on his takeout, and it's all tied up 3-3. An exchange of singles has Canada in front of the States 5-3 as they play the sixth end, and Jenkins has the U.S. in trouble again. Coach and father Don Barkham is most concerned. A miss by Don Jr. with his final stone would almost be fatal at this point. Whoa, watch it. Whoa. Whoa. Canada's lead is cut to 
to 5-4 after six ends. The all-Scandinavian struggle hasn't changed. After seven ends, it's still tied 4-4. Norway has last rock on the eighth, and this takeout will make it 5-4 Norway with just two ends remaining. Canada and the United States blank the seventh end, so it still is 5-4 Canada in their game. Two more points for a 7-4 lead after eight ends. The ninth end was a blank for Norway-Sweden, so the Norwegians are one up going home. Sweden has a Norway counter to beat in the 12-foot circle as Anders Gran plays the draw that could mean an extra end. He's there. 5-5 five, five after 10 ends, and Norway will have the hammer on the 11th. Down three points playing the ninth, the United States hasn't given up. They're lying two and trying for a front ring guard on this one. Jenkins had a great deal of respect for his U.S. opponent. They're a great team, there's no question about it. They went through this competition with eight and one, which might have been a bit to their disadvantage. They might have been a bit overconfident after hammering us during the week when we were in our slump. I think they took us a little lighter than they should have taken us. Markham can exchange for two points, and maybe three if that guard is on the ring. No, it's not a biter. Only two for the Americans, and instead of a tie, it's seven to six Canada. Back to that extra end, Norway, Sweden. Sweden has the shot stone at the edge of the forefoot. As Skip Anders Gran tries to guard it. The guard is a trifle long, leaving the Swedish counter largely exposed. But you never know in curling. The last rock of the game. Sweden has the winning point. Norway has been eliminated six to five. And that's a very disappointed sure loon. With Canada one up and last rock against him, Don Barkham of North Dakota adds to a cluster at the front of the house. Jenkins decides he can't break it open and he calls for third John Scales to draw through a narrow port. Markham couldn't bury on the left side of the house and after Jenkins took out the U.S. stone, Canada was lying too. The Americans have to go for an intern hit and roll. Barkham's right. final stone. Jenkins doesn't have to play his last rock. The Canadians have made the final with their third victory of the day. Bill, it's been quite a week for you. You started out in great fashion, winning three in a row, then slumped, and then, of course, you've come up off the floor to qualify for the final. Would you analyze the week uh, in some fashion similar to that? Well, we came here expecting some really tough opposition, and the team was really up for it. We won our first three games against 
two of the better rinks in the competition and everything seemed to be rolling along fairly well. And then everybody started telling us, you'll have no problem making the finals. That's when it all started. And we lost our next four games. But we realized that it was possible for us to make the playoffs if we won our last two games. So the boys really put a good effort forward. And today, it's really proved it. And we won three games today. That's right. And now, the World Junior Curling Final. For the third straight year, it's Canada versus Sweden. Beforehand, there are well wishes from the teams that didn't make it. The CBC cameras are there with Chevy and Doogie. Two more interested commentators. And Jean Pouillot of the Quebec media. Sweden made a last rock takeout to go in front 1-0 on the first end. And on the second, Canada's John Scales rolled across the house off a Swedish stone. Anders Gran goes after the Canadian counter with his first rock of the second end. Jenkins took advantage of that miss to set up two Canadian counters. And after an exchange of hits, Canada has this chance for two. to be one of the many successful, crucial shots made by Jenkins in the final. The Canadian skip's performance was to be one of the finest ever by a curler in any international curling final. On the third end, Jenkins is about to set up two counters with his last rock. it behind the cover out in front and Jenkins has another beauty. One of the early pressure situations. Gron has to follow Jenkins' path. Single point for Sweden, and after three ends, it's a two-all tie. Jenkins and Gron continued their steady shot making on the fourth end, and Jenkins drew to the house for a 3-2 lead. Now, end number five, and this is where the championship was won and lost. Canada had two counters tucked away, and Jenkins tries for a third. piece of the button, and even the opposition skip has to salute a super curling shot. So, the pivotal situation. Facing three Canadian counters, Ron has to produce with this final stone. But it's another wreck on the front. And Canada steals three points to take a vital jump, six to two, after five in. Jenkins gave nothing away on the sixth in. Sweden scored one. But on the seventh, Gron laid in a superb draw behind cover at the top of the four-foot ring. You couldn't place it much better than that and it looked like a surefire counter for Sweden. Jenkins had one shot only, a long odds angular raised takeout. You'll never see a shot any better than that. Canada scores again, and it's 7-3 after seven in. Jenkins was credited with a performance of over 90% in this game. He was just unbeatable when it counted the most. Gron of Sweden tried his best, but he didn't have the experience of his former skip Jan Olsten. And Jenkins was making it tougher and tougher each end. A break did come for Sweden on the eighth end. Early misses set up two for the Swedes, 
and Jenkins rolled too far on this takeout. Anders has a draw for two. for Sweden and Canada's lead is 7-5 going to the ninth end. With three rocks to come, Jenkins draws to the heart of the house in behind that front cover. Ron is under pressure again. Now Canada has the chance to make it nine to five heading home. And the way Jenkins was curling, that was just a mere formality. With the World Junior Championship now so close, the boys from Charlottetown hit every Swedish stone in sight. Canada has retained the Uniroll World Junior Curling Championship. And what a thrilling way to do it. Counted out by most people after four defeats, the Canadians did it the hard way with six straight victories. Iona Campanola, Canada's Minister of Fitness and Amateur Sport, presents the Uniroyal Trophy and gold medals to Bill Jenkins, John Scales, Sandy Stewart, and Alan Mayhew. The runner-up silvers are presented to Sweden by Uniroyal Vice President Ken Cleaver. To Anders Grahn, Matt Nieberg, Bo Soderstrom, and Bo Stromberg. The bronze medals go to Don and Earl Barkham, and to Dale and Gary Mueller of the United States, with Sven Eklund of the International Curling Federation there to do the honors. Then individual awards... Based on performance only in the round robin, the all-stars are Norway's Roar Risa, Gary Mueller of the United States, Sweden's Mats Nieberg, and the skip who won eight games and lost only once in the round robin, Don Barkham Jr. Barkham earned another distinction. He was selected as the week's most sportsmanlike curler. And thus, another World Junior Championship goes into the record books. The Uniroyal banner is lowered for presentation to representatives of the host center for the 1978 playdown. General Chairman Pierre Greco passes the banner to the delegation from Grindelwald, Switzerland, an Alpine community located in the midst of a Sumeric wonderland. That's where the top junior curlers in the world will be in 1978.